morning. morning. Let's begin class with prayer this morning. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your kindness, the truth that you've revealed through Christ, the privilege of knowing you and sharing the truths of your kingdom with others. We ask that your spirit will join us this morning, that we will be able to have discernment and insight into the truths you have for us. pray in your holy name. Amen. We're doing lesson number seven in the quarterly, The Role of the Church in the Community, and the title this week is Jesus Desired Their Good. And if you look at the Sabbath lesson, I'm just going to read that, a little story here, and take some, uh, uh, some thoughts from that. It says, on Sabbath morning during Sabbath school uh, and worship service, skateboarders can often be seen rolling past the main doors of a local Seventh-day Adventist church. Why? Beca because this church meets in a community youth center facility right next door to a skateboard park. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Okay. Um, and if you thought these skateboarders uh, were an unexpected annoyance, think again. Instead, in an effort to curb the rising youth crime rate, the government in this, their city built the park to provide a place for the youth to engage in wholesome recreation. When the youth center and skateboard park were finished, the government wanted a church congregation to hold its worship services in the community youth center facility. The community leaders felt that the presence of a church would have a positive moral influence on the youth who used the park. They invited several churches of various Christian denominations, but only one accepted the church that had Sabbath school and worship on Saturday morning. These Adventist church, the, these Adventist church members were excited about moving into the center for the skateboarders were part of the group they wanted to reach. The local church's definition of church is a community that does not exist for itself. This should be a definition for all our churches as well. What do you think about the story? Do you like it? Yeah, okay. It's a beautiful thing. I thought it was wonderfully uh, told, wonderful story. Love for others, connecting, outreaching. Okay, um, can you envision your church doing this? Yeah, okay, good, good. Um, now, the Rick, would you be willing to do this? Good, good. And if you were willing to do this, would you be willing for your, ch your children to bring their skateboards and go out and skateboard on Sabbath with the other kids? Would, would, would that be a comfort for most of the members of your local church? Would they feel comfortable with their kids bringing skateboards to church and skateboarding? Why, why or why not? What would be the problem with that? Is there a problem with that? No problem? No, okay. Do we... Uh, do we, you guys are kind of an advanced class. <laughs> do you think that would be true for most of the members of the Adventist church in this community? Do you think if we went to the, one of the local churches with our kids and the kids brought their skateboards and they invited the other kids from their Sabbath school to go out and skateboard in the parking lot, that the local leadership would be okay with that? I would not have let you do that as a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, mama speaks the truth. I would not have been able to do that as a little boy. Was I the only one that would have had that restriction? Yes. When my kids went to the church school in Ohio, we would um, play basketball and stuff on Sabbath in the gym. I had a key to the church, but the other members didn't know I had a key. The pastor asked me to shh, because they would have gotten mad had they known that my kids were. We would play, we would take um, Bible names out of the Bible. Instead of playing pig, we would do Bible names and just do different things. They needed something to do. Yep. And I think, I think that community, organizing, these types of things, this is the person, point I'm getting with. You know, would, would you send a message to the, the youth community that are skateboarding that we want to, you know, we want to love you, we want to bring you into the church, but when you come into the church, you have to quit skateboarding on Sabbath? Unless you join a Sunday church, then it's okay to skateboard on Sabbath. You can be a member, you can love Jesus, be safe, skateboard on Sabbath, but if you join the Adventist church, you can't skateboard on Sabbath. Do you, th you think there are Adventists that would give them that message? Yes. Would that be a right message? No. No. Um, do we ever communicate a message that's more gracious to non-members than we do to members? Are we, ever, are we ever stricter on members of the church than we are on non-members? What's that all about? When Jesus said, Luke eleven forty six, Jesus said, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry and you yourselves will not lift a finger to help them. Do you think it was an accident, a coincidence that Jesus stated that those who are burdening people are experts in the law? <coughs> he, this time he didn't say you Pharisees, you Sadducees, he said you experts in the law. Do you think it's an accident? How do legal theologies 
And legal theologians burden people. Have you ever been burdened in your religious experience growing up? Did you feel burdens placed on you? Pressures? <clears throat> things you could carry? Weighted down? What do they focus on? What do the, the, the legal theologies and legal theologians focus on? They focus on people, but specifically what? Regulations. Rules, regulations, behavior. Yeah, rules, regulations, and behavior. That's exactly right. 2,000 years ago, the religionists... Now think about the Sabbath. Should the Sabbath be a day in which we have more regulation, more rules, more restrictions, more enslavement, more burdens? Or should the Sabbath be the day, the day of the week with the most liberty, the most freedom of any other day of the week? Is it your general expression when the Sabbath comes, you experience huge weights rolling off of you and great freedom? Or when the Sabbath comes, you, all the things you can't do and the more restrictions? 2,000 years ago, the religious leaders wanted to restrict healing on Sabbath. Did they not? Now, we're not talking just, you know, did Christ heal on Sabbath? Yes. Did he heal just emergency cases? No. Now, there's a guy who was paralyzed or, or invalid for 38 years. 38 years, it can wait one more day, right? I mean, in medical practice, they go, I've got a problem I've had for 38 years. Can I come say, no, you can wait till Monday. <laughs> Isn't that what we do in medical practice? 38 years, you can wait till Monday. <laughs> okay? Christ didn't wait till Monday. He healed him on Sabbath. But they wanted to restrict. Now, notice what healing. I mean, this is the, hopefully we've conditioned you guys enough that I'm always coming back now at least to this imposed rules that are not connected in any way to reality, really. They're just arbitrary and they haven't imposed versus design stuff. Christ in healing, what's the consequence to the person he's healing? Liberty, freedom. They had been restrained, enslaved uh, by their condition. They couldn't, couldn't move freely and so forth. So in healing on Sabbath, he's staying. Sabbath is a day of liberty, it's a day of freedom, restoring to, to how I've constructed things. And, and the closer we are, we have more liberty. They wanted to restrict how much someone could carry on Sabbath. Did you know that? Did Christ ever give such, such restrictions how much you can carry? Even today, today, I went online and looked this up. How much could a Jew, Jew carry on Sabbath? And I found out that it was not historic. It's actually today. I found the rules for today. And so I, I just, this is just right off the internet. I copied and pasted this. It's on Shabbat, one may not carry or transfer objects between a reshut hakid, yakid, which is a private enclosed domain such as a house. You can't transfer it between uh, the house and the reshut ha rabim which is the public domain, such as the street. Examples of this prohibition include carrying anything in one's pocket, carrying anything in one's hand, wheeling a baby carriage, going outside with gum or food in your mouth. Today, there are people who live under this restriction. Yes? Isn't there like a law that they can only uh, take 100 steps or something like that? Uh, that was the next one I was getting to. Okay? Yeah. But under the restrictions, under this, let's stick with the carry one for a minute. Under the restrictions of this carry law, I couldn't carry in all the materials that we give away at our class each week. You couldn't carry away with you the Bible, the study guides, the DVDs. You'd have to leave your, An umbrella. Leave your keys in the car. Yeah. You actually, in the same rules, you actually can't drive a car yep. because you're not, allowed to, you're not allowed to create a fire and turning the ignition causes a spark and that creates a fire, which you can't do on Sabbath. Okay? And so in the homes of people who practice this restriction, they turn all the lights they want on before the Sabbath comes or they have timers. The timers that they set will then turn the lights on and off at the times they want them to go, but they can't do it. I remember when I was in my residency, excuse me, my, my uh, third year of medical school, we had a person who practiced this on our, my third year team for surgery. And we came out of a surgery on Friday night and we went in before Sabbath. We came out of the surgery after the Sabbath had begun. And the TV in the doctor's lounge was on. And this particular fellow, a nice guy, loved, loved the guy, um, loved the Memphis State basketball uh, team. And, and there's a Memphis State basketball game on that night. And so he came in and he asked me if I would change the channel for him because he could watch the game on Sabbath, but he couldn't change the channel to watch the game on Sabbath <laughs> because that would be sparking. So I could change it for him. And, and notice that this is what happens when we live under a rules-oriented system. Do you understand the rules are about behavior? It doesn't matter what he's watching on Sabbath, his character, his mind, what he's putting in. That, that's not relevant. What's only relevant is if he's doing the rules. Yes? 
Two quick things. Uh, in New York or in larger cities where they had a high rise and there was a large Jewish population, they actually programmed the elevator to stop at every floor going up and down uh, every Sabbath so that they could get on and off without touching the buttons to create the spark. Yeah. And so the programming allowed that to happen. The other part, though, had a, um, someone sharing that they had traveled to Jerusalem. And in stark contrast to where the somber entry so often in our, in our Adventist homes, it, they were struck by the celebration. They were down uh, by the, the wall. And there was anticipation and uh, songs of happiness and dance occurring. And they joined in with the, the Jews in this dance of welcoming the Sabbath with great enthusiasm. And I, I had expected her to tell me how somber it was. And to have it greeted with over joy and uh, dancing and song, uh, I thought actually it was quite beautiful. <laughs> Did they carry the, the sheet music if they needed it to go to the, oh, I guess not. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and there was restrictions that was said a moment ago on how far you could walk on Sabbath. And, and I'm pointing this out because thinking about these skateboard kids, what kind of religion do we want to present? The religion of Christ is a religion of freedom. It's a religion of liberty. They wanted to restrict the disciples from pulling heads of grain and actually dealing with their hunger on Sabbath. Christ didn't put any restrictions on that. What about today? Do we get caught up in arbitrary rules and restrictions of liberty? What about playing tennis on Sabbath? Yes. So how do you keep the Sabbath holy? Oh, well, let's, so, so notice that. Keep the Sabbath holy. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Which day of the week in our world and we won't argue about which day is Sabbath. I think we all settled on 24-hour time chronology of which day that is. Um, but which day of the week in society around the world do you think is the day that has the most partying, the most desecrations, if you will? What day of the week would that be? Sunday. So the world currently is desecrating, if you will. Does that make it less holy? No. Think that through. Is there anything you can do to make the Sabbath less holy? So, is there, anything you do, is there anything that you can do that can keep it holy? It's always holy. It doesn't change. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What's it? It's not talking about keeping it holy. What's it talking about? Our hearts and perception. Uh, keeping yourselves holy. Now, can you keep yourselves holy one day a week? Get your mind around. How many, how many Christians of various denominations try to keep themselves holy one day a week. So you can't keep the Sabbath holy by changing your behavior one day a week. It can't, it, it can't work. You miss the blessing. Because the new covenant, and some of you look like you're confused. Wait a second, but that's how it's supposed to work. All week long I do my business, and then on the seventh day I set it all aside so I can keep it holy, and that's how we keep holy. No, it's not. If you're doing that, you're not keeping the Sabbath holy. Amen. Because the Sabbath doesn't change in its holiness. It's just, it's, it, it's just a period of time. It's set aside by God. It's holy regardless of what we do on it. Its holiness doesn't change. The week is for preparation. What's kept holy is the people. Now, remember the Sabbath to keep. Now, are we only to remember that one day a week? Or to remember that all week? Now, what are we to remember that keeps it holy? The God of the Sabbath. Oh, okay, now we're getting into it. The God of the Sabbath. So, so the Sabbath is given to remember. Remember what? Creation. What do we remember in creation? You can remember several things from creation that doesn't help holiness. The loving God who created you and all around you. Yeah, yeah, it, absolutely. We're getting there. Absolutely. God is love. That's, that's key. But people often present God as creator. And they take that and segue that into God is powerful. He created. And I brought you into the world. I'll take you out. <laughs> okay, that kind, of, that kind of an attitude. That if you don't do what I say, God's powerful. Remember, he set this day aside as an arbitrary test. He wants to see whether you'll be loyal to him. If you're not, then he'll, he'll, he'll nuke you. Does that help keep your mind and heart holy? No. So you can have this uh, that, that actually corrupts you. You can keep this out. Think about the people 2,000 years ago who put Christ on the cross. Why'd they want him down by sunset? <laughs> To keep the Sabbath holy. Were they keeping it holy? 
by killing the Son of God? I don't think so. But yet we got him down. We kept the rules. We didn't go into, we didn't go into Pilate's judgment hall. That would have desecrated us. So we kept all the rules. We're holy, right? No. That's not how you keep Sabbath holy. It's by having, what's the new covenant? Write my law where? It's by being recreated in the inner person. So the Sabbath reminds us of creation because what laws govern creation? What kinds of laws govern creation? Design law. God is the creator. He built reality to run on certain protocols. And thus, when we remember creation, we come back to live in harmony with God who has constructed reality to operate on the principles of love, and we are reconciled to him, and thus we are holy beings living in harmony with his design all week long. And the Sabbath is a celebration to remember what freedoms we have in him. So that's how I understand we keep it holy. It's not about a certain list of checklists of do's and don'ts. Let's, let's, let's move on. Can I just say one more, one little thing before we... Yes. In Isaiah um, 58, uh, starting with verse uh, 13, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you honor it by not going your own way, not speaking as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find... Your joy in the Lord. Okay, so what was the message of that passage? Have some special time with me from God. Could be. I heard a different message. Any other message? Sabbath isn't all about me and what I need. Mean. Yes, this is the core. It's not even about, it, 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 if you're selfish in your heart, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. The, 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 the antagonistic principles at war for every human heart are God's character and principles of love. Greater love is no man than to give his life for a friend versus the selfish survival of fittest principle of the world. I love myself so much, I'll do whatever I have to do for me. That's the core. We're infected from birth with self-centeredness, survival of fittest drive. God wants to restore in us his character of selfless love. If you notice, if you call the Sabbath a light and seek from doing what you're desired, in other words, you're stopped being selfish. Now, is it only one day a week we're to stop being selfish? No, it's all week long we're to live lives that reveal the character of God and his love. We're to have love in our hearts all week long. And so what they were doing is they were making the Sabbath into some other form of self, whether it's Phariseeism and, and putting themselves up and looking, I'm, I'm fasting on Sabbath, it makes me holier than you and, and so forth and so on. Using this, And I've seen people in churches do this. They dress, you know, you get the criticism of the overly adorned woman who has tons of jewelry and makeup and so forth, and they criticize, oh, she's just drawing attention to herself. But nobody really notices the overly plain woman who makes sure that she is so plain and so 1880s in her dress and style that she, everybody notices how pious she is. It's the same selfishness. Have you not seen that? Yeah, and, and so that's what I think it's talking about, that the day is not about gratifying self, and therefore the life is not about gratifying self. That's the key. Um, Jesus said, come unto me all that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's a rest. Something about the Sabbath in there, maybe. I'm, I'm, the Sabbath was not made for man, but man for... Excuse me, I said that backwards. Man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. Isn't that how it goes? Yeah, I got that backwards. I was distracted. Okay. See, legal religions occur because people who often intend to do good fail to understand how reality actually works and are stuck at that level four and below. And they actually think God works this way. And the danger here is when, when you want to live that level seven, you want to jump levels, you don't want to grow, you don't want to develop, you want to actually advance through the stages of acquiring greater insight and wisdom. You just want to jump from the level you're at all the way to that purpose-driven life, level seven, fulfilling God's purposes. And what's the danger when you go to a purpose-driven life, but you're operating at level four and below? Level four and below, law and order, rules-oriented, eye for an eye, tooth mentality, right is, uh, is when you get rewarded, wrong is when you get punished. Uh, this, is, this is level four and below thinking. It's, it's rules and arbitrary enforcement and coercion. God must punish sin. And if that's how you think reality works and you want to fulfill God's purposes, then what do you do? Pardon? You do it with gusto, all the rules and 
Yeah, you become critics, you become judgmental, you have intolerance for people who aren't keeping the rules the way you're doing it, you seek to, to use arbitrary power, get hold of the state to pass laws to make sure other people conform to your, your will. Uh, my wife and I were in Nashville this week and we met some people who were visiting Nashville from Delaware and we had a conversation, we were sitting down and, uh, and sharing uh, some, some hors d'oeuvres with them and, and uh, conversing with them and he runs a restaurant in, um, in Delaware and he's having a problem because he's, he's, he's got opening his fourth restaurant and he, you know, as you run successful restaurants, most of them have a liquor license to sell spirits and so forth. And, and he was having problems because he was putting his restaurant next to a Baptist church. And the Baptist church was out uh, uh, getting signatures to, to, to go to the city council to, to try to prevent him from being able to, to sell beer and wine at his restaurant. That'll be his best restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> now... Now, what, what, do, you, do you understand, the, the, and, and he was, he was uh, going through the route of the in, enhancing the property values and other, other people who live in the community want it there and all this. I said, why don't you go down the route of, they're trying to use the state to enforce their religious values on you. That's what they're trying to do. They don't value what you're doing. They have a religious objection, and they're trying to enforce a religious objection on your, on your, on your business. That's what happens when you operate at level four and below. Sunday, lesson contrasts the message of Jonah to Nineveh to Jesus' message to Jerusalem. Let's identify the characters very quickly in the two scenarios. We have God who, is, who sent Jonah as the messenger and who sent Jesus as our savior. We have Jonah, the messenger to Nineveh. We have Jesus, the messenger to Jerusalem and to the whole world. We have the people of Nineveh and we have the people of Jerusalem in the world. Did God have a different, did God have a different agenda for the two cities? A different agenda. Did God have a different agenda for, for Nineveh and Jerusalem? Or is God's agenda the same? Same. Yeah, God wanted the same thing. Was the specific presentation. So both of them are coming from God with a motive from God's heart to save the people and save the cities. That's what God wants to do. When the messengers came, did they present their messages in the same way? No. Now those presentations were different, weren't they? Why, why do you think the message is presented differently, it, were, were presented differently, if God had the same goal and they were both coming from God? The messengers didn't have the same uh, attitude. Ah, <laughs> oh, the messengers didn't have the same attitude. So how would you characterize the message from Jonah to Nineveh? How would you characterize that message? Re God repent or die. <laughs> repent or die. This, this was a message of threat. Eminent destruction. Punishment. Would you characterize the message that Jonah presented as a message of love and mercy and grace? No. It was not, was it? Okay. How would you characterize the message that Jesus brought to Jerusalem? Love, mercy, and grace. Love, mercy, and grace. Forgiveness. The goodness of God. Well, we not only were the messengers different, but the recipients of the message. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. It says, which message... Of those two messages now, we see, okay, God sent both messengers. One message was eminent threat, punishment, fear, inducing. One message is love, grace. Which message appears to have been more effective in bringing the cities to repentance? Isn't this interesting? Huh. The response of the cities now, that's the next thing, the response of the cities. Um, do we learn any lessons from this? Why would the lesser light, and would we say Jonah was the lesser light? Why was the lesser light more effective than the greater and brighter light? The people of Nineveh were on level one, maybe. The parable of the sower. It's the soil. Okay. So, I, I like where you're going. I like both of these thoughts. Um, God deals with you where you are, and that is the message that they had to receive because it's what they could understand. And they could understand it better because here's Jonah, probably bleached white for being inside a big fish for three days, coming out of a big fish to a country to people who worship a god of a fish, yeah. and you know what he said was going to have a tremendous effect on them. Yeah. Okay. Also, long-term effectiveness. I mean, Nineveh didn't stay the light of the world for for millennia to come. But the, the message of Christ uh, has touched millions. 
Um, so Jonah's presentation, you would say, was different than that of Jesus. But what did God, by his actions in Nineveh, reveal to the Ninevites? So there we see it, don't we? There's that same message of love, mercy, and forgiveness revealed by God. So God reveals the same character in both places. God, by showing mercy and grace and forgiveness, and sparing the city, as Jesus revealed to Jerusalem. Um, what was Jonah's response to God's mercy? I knew that's what you said. Why did you send me? I knew you were going to do this. Um, if Jesus would have been there instead of Jonah in Nineveh, how do you think he would have responded to the repentance of the people? Yeah, you see the difference there. So, so this is back to the point, noticing the players. There's a difference in heart attitude, an understanding, in mindset, in orientation of, of focus between, between Jonah and, and Jesus. If Jonah was in Jerusalem, though, when Jesus was on the scene, whose side do you think Jonah would have sidled up to? Would he have been one of the apostles or would he have been with the church leaders who crucified Christ? Might Jonah have been at risk to be with those who hated the Samaritans? No, yes, no? Yes. Interesting. What, what was God's attitude towards Jonah and Jonah's anger and selfishness? How did God respond to that? A subtle parable. A subtle parable. So this is out of um, um, manuscript 164, 1897 from Ellen White. It says, Jonah revealed that he did not value the souls in that wretched city. He valued his reputation lest they should say he was a false prophet. Now when he sees the Lord exercise his compassionate attributes and spare the city that he that had corrupted its ways before him, Jonah does not cooperate with God in his merciful design. He has not the people's interest in view. It does not grieve him that so large a number must perish who have not been educated to do right. Listen to his complaint. And he quotes out of Jonah where he complains about all this. And then the Lord gave Jonah... An object lesson, he prepared a worm after the gourd came up and prevented shade, a worm when the morning rose the next morning who smote the gourd and it withered. And it came to pass when the sun had risen that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat down upon Jonah's head. And uh, then the Lord said to Jonah, thou hadst pity on the gourd for which thou did not labor or made grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not spare none of the great city where are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left. You know what that means in Bible terms? More than six, six score thousand children, probably below the age of six. They can't even tell left and right yet. And also much cattle. I love that. Why do you think that's thrown in there? Shouldn't I not be concerned about all the, 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 the thousands and tens of thousands of kids and also the cattle? <laughs> It goes back to Christ uh, or God telling Israel, you know, stop it with the sacrifices. I have the, the odor is abominable to me. He, he doesn't want any death. He doesn't want death of a of an insect. Well, he cares for the animals, the other life as well as he does for human life. That's Correct. That's right. There's texts that refer to the he cares. He knows about the sparrow and feeds the birds as much as he does the human side. So in the last part of that quote, it says, in the history of Nineveh, there's a lesson that you should study carefully. You must know your duty to your fellow beings who are ignorant and defiled and who need your help. What is our duty to our fellow human beings? Love them as we love ourselves. So we have just looked at the contrast of two messages. We looked at the message of Jonah. We looked at the message of Jesus. We look at our duty to go out and then be maybe messengers to the world who don't know. Which message today do you think is the message we should be taking to the world? The message of doom and destruction and repent or God's going to burn you in hell? Or the message of love, grace, and forgiveness? Which message should we take? Yes. At the same time that Jonah was alive, there were other people who had different attitudes, different approaches, whatever. And Christ, through other prophets, gave a different message. They're in this time, same time. To Nineveh? 
No, to, no. to a different people who okay. have different needs. Right, okay. The world is not homogenous. So our message to a given individual or a given group of people may be repent or you die. Yeah, okay. depends on the audience, that's right. Okay. There are other individuals who have different attitudes, different needs or whatever, who need a different message. W what happens in your experience, and let's see if you've ever experienced this, I've experienced it more than once, being in a city and having somebody on a street corner with a big bullhorn and a sign preaching doom and destruction and if you don't repent from your sins. Is, is, am I the only one who's experienced that? Uh, what, what, what's your experience when you experience that? Do you, that, do you want to go over and, and converse with that person? Does it draw you to them? Also, are they open to conversing? And oftentimes they're not necessarily. Yeah, yes. No, I don't want to go and converse with a person because I'm sort of fearful of them. But it does bring me to a state of mind to thinking maybe how to change the way I do things. Okay. I guess it depends on what you're doing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> How about if you were out handing out some Sabbath afternoon literature and tracks, maybe how to change it and not hand those out anymore? Right. <laughs> yeah. The other week, uh, my mom and I um, went to Starbucks and saw this lady that was, it was, it was hot out, right? But she had gloves and a hoodie and like everything on sweat to death. I remember we looked at each other like, oh, did you see a sweat on her? Can you speak up just a little bit? Sorry, I, I speak soft. Yeah. I said, do you see a sweat on her? She's like, she was like, yeah, she's sweating, she's sweating to death. She looks hungry. I was like, I'm hungry too, you know. <laughs> you know, you get me a pizza instead, but I was joking with her. But she went and got her pizza, right? All the way down the road, got her pizza and gave it to her. Right when she gave it to her, she, I don't even know if she said thanks or not, but she just started just, you know, mowing down. Two, uh, a week later, I was working. Uh, where I work at Little Caesars, where we got the pizza, and we saw that lady driving a car. I saw that lady driving her car. So I mean, some of the, some of those people own houses, cars. They just do that for extra money. So I mean, you get a skeptical sometimes. That too. Discernment. What, yes. What were the results in Nineveh? What were the results in Nineveh? The city yeah. repented. Nineveh believed Jonah's message. Yep. So apparently it was fertile soil, like Wendell uh, stated, and I believe there are passages in, in you know, Ellen White's writings that says that it were centuries before and Nineveh was eventually consumed and destroyed. So think about the generations that perhaps are going to be in heaven because of that. Exactly. So it's mm -hmm. like our message should be tailored to the audience. You don't talk to a you don't talk to a three year old the way you talk to an adult. Are you, are you saying you don't pass out skateboards and sand to a home folks home? <laughs> I could use some more referrals, so I might do that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this quote? Can I agree with you, actually. I think it's, that's wisdom. Tailoring the message to the audience is wisdom. I think that's exactly right. Paul talks about in the New Testament how he's this to that person and this to this person. I think it's wisdom. And then, then, then what, how do you apply this? quote as we think about the fundamental overall message that we're taking. Christ Object Lessons 415. It is the darkness of misapprehension about God that is shrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed. A message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. Now, was Jonah's message to that audience a message of love? Well, if it brought them to repentance and restoration, it was a message. When a parent, when a parent has a child riding their tricycle on their driveway, heading into the street, and there's a hedge and they can't see the truck and the parents up on the porch and sees the truck coming and the parents yells with, with, with threats. You better stop now or else. And maybe even else an imposed threat or else I'm gonna spank your bottom. Is that a message of love? Yes, it absolutely is a message of love. In the context, what was Nineveh heading to? So if we understand the context, even potentially, if they're so out of control, this is what was happening at the foot of Sinai, when God thundered at Sinai. If you remember, they were all terrified, but what were they doing? 
Would they have heard a still small voice that Elijah heard? Would they, if God would have come with a still small whisper while they were in the middle of this orgy of uh, worshiping the golden calf, would they have heard that? No, they would have not heard and not responded. So he thunders. And yet, if you read Exodus 20, while he's thundering, all the people were afraid. Moses is standing right there and he goes, there's no need to be afraid. Just like if your child with the tricycle had a friend and they were both riding and you shouted and threatened and, the, and, and, and they stop and they don't get hit. And then your, your child says, hey, I want you to meet my mom or dad. And he's, yeah, I don't want to meet your parents. They're scary. No, there's no need to be afraid. You see, that's how it works, right? But you have to know him. Part of what I hear us saying about the people of Nineveh is that they may not have understood the design laws of the Creator. Yeah, I don't think... We're operating on, you know, one to four scale of, of uh, knowledge and so on. I would submit, however, that they may have been much more sophisticated in the sense that they were very violent and oppressive people. That was one of the outcries that God heard and sent, he sent Jonah to them because of that. I, I submit that they understood design law and that they knew that they were doing wrong, but that they were thinking somehow that they were righteous in doing it anyway because their God allowed that type of thing. Interesting. Um, Monday's lesson, it's... Um First paragraph, it says, a leper approached Jesus and begs for healing. Conventional wisdom says that this man should be isolated. Jesus, the clean one, touches him and heals him anyway. Peter denies Jesus three times during his trial. After the resurrection, having searched Peter's heart, Jesus reinstates him to his service anyway. God's church in Corinth is unappreciative of Paul's authority and influence. Paul serves them anyway. What do you think of this idea of the, what they call in the lesson the anyway principle? What, what is that idea trying to suggest? The anyway principle. You've got to be first. Well, they don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. You've got to be maximum, maximum, maximum security. <laughs> Could it be suggesting that what matters to us is not what matters to God? Well, clearly. Yeah. Could it be suggesting that? That we think things matter and they really don't matter. That's why they're going anyway. They're going anyway. It's like, how could it be? It's, he's doing it anyway. He's helping. He's, he's still reaching out anyway. He, 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 he selects Peter anyway. It's like, because maybe we, it's anyway to us because there's something in our mind that's saying, well, that shouldn't be. But God's the same today, yesterday, today, forever. He doesn't change. What seems to matter to us too often as human beings, as sinful human beings? Appearance. Appearance. Does ethnicity often matter to us? No. Yes. Oh, to us? To us. Yes. Were the Jews at Christ Day very prejudiced? How about today? Are there prejudices today? Uh, what about status, social class, wealth, position, authority? In earthly politics, and it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right, just look today, right now, this is political season. Do you find that, that it, and by the way, the, the Bible describes earthly politics, earthly governments as beastly? How appropriate. That's what it describes them as. Beasts that tear and shred. Does it not? Yes. And so if you look at our politics right now, it doesn't matter if you're left or right. Do you see either side trying to unite and bring peace? Or do they both actively do things that constantly stir up agitation and division? They're constantly tearing and shredding. That's how the world does things. Why? Because we can get a coalition to empower us if we find a common enemy to fight against. And so we create enemies in our own society. We pit people against people. We don't, but the, the Bible message is that we are all united under one head, Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if they're male or female, Jew or Greek, what ethnicity, whether social status, that's irrelevant. We all come under the one, but that's not what earthly governments do. Earthly governments want division. There is no political leader in this country that actually wants real unity in this country. They all want division. And if you watch what's happening right now, it is clear that they do things to cause division. So they can get their power base and structure. It's just a matter of how they carve the pie. They're both fighting to get the little bit. I want 51% of the pie. You can have 49. <laughs> then I can be in control. How about health? Do we 
shy away from people based on health problems. You're going to say, well, we would never do that. Yeah. How about mental health problems? Do we discriminate against people based on mental health problems? How did Jesus pe treat those who presented to him with clear mental health problems? Engaged. Extra kindness. And he healed them. Religion. Do we discriminate based on religion? How about within the same denominational system? Do we have divisions? Within Judaism, there were Pharisees and Sadducees, and you can see the fighting back and forth constantly. And Paul was even able to turn them against each other. One of his trials, if you remember, when he talked about he's on trial for resurrection, and they started the fighting so bad amongst themselves. They're all Jews there to get him, and he turns them against themselves because they were so divided under their own supposed religion. How about in our own church? Are we divided? And, and, and did any of that stuff they were divided on really matter? How about history of sin? Do we discriminate against people because of the history of factually known sin in their life? Not rumor, made up stuff, but known. Polygamy, Abraham, deceit and fraud, Jacob, murdered Moses, adultery and murder, David, making idols, Aaron and Gideon. Would any of these people be allowed to be your pastor? No, <laughs> what, but the point I'm making here is what matters to God? See, all the stuff that matters, what matters to God? Your heart. So, yes, right. Somebody said the heart. What the issue, there's only one issue that's ever really mattered to God, and that is do we trust God so that we open the heart and cooperate with him for renewing and transformation? That's the only thing that's ever mattered, period. So with that in mind, will there be anyone in heaven uh, saved eternally who has not been renewed in heart? No, not one. Will there be people in heaven who belong to different religious groups on earth? Will there be people who were baptized in different ways and some who were never baptized ritualistically at all? Yes. Will there be people who took communion and people who never took communion? Will there be people who worship on Sabbath who never worship on Sabbath? You, 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 the, think of the things that would divide us. Does that mean any of those things I mentioned are bad to do? Bad to partake communion? Bad to be bad? No, it's not bad to do. It just isn't a requirement for salvation. Following and responding to the light that you have in that heart Now, when you, people say, wait a second, the Bible says unless you're baptized. Well, baptism that, that is required is not the ritual. The required baptism is the, and baptism is a, is a transmuted word. It actually just means immersion. It's the immersion of your heart and mind and character into the reality of Jesus Christ so that you are renewed and cleansed in the inner person that's the baptism that's required. So there'll be nobody in heaven who hasn't gone through that immersion, that regeneration. But there'll be many that may have never gone through the ritual. The ritual's not required. The reality is required. Does that make sense? Last paragraph says, Jesus is calling us to show love and to be kind to people in spite of the fact they hate you and are your enemies. Notice, too, that Jesus links these acts and attitudes with the character of God. But love your enemies, do good to them, and, uh, do good to them, and lend to them without expe expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And then underneath that it says, Why, how do we understand the idea that God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked? How do you understand that? Who on earth would be saved if God was not kind to the, un, to the wicked, okay? Is there anyone that's righteous in and of themselves other than Jesus Christ? No, all, are, all are wicked. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. All have gone astray. So this, this idea, notice the idea in our minds, we actually draw a line, don't we? There are some who are righteous and some, and I'm not among the unrighteous, I'm among the righteous. And we make this division. But all of us have, have come short of the glory of God. And if God wasn't kind to sinners, we would all be in a bad way. Isn't it true? And it's the same thing with us and why I said earlier, you first. 
is because what will break a chain of reaction back and forth, back and forth? Somebody has to be first. Somebody has to reach out. Jesus reached out to us. We reach out to other people who, who are never going to reach out to us. And so, Start with them. do we believe God is really kind to the wicked or only kind up to a point while he's keeping score along the way? And then if they fail to repent because of his kindness, then the scorecard comes out and he inflicts the justly due punishments for their failures. Which is the most, which, which view is most, most common in Christianity, do you think, in the world? Do you think it's the one he's kind always or the one that he's kind to a point and then the scorecard comes out? Well, Tuesday's lesson talks about love never fails. And I just want you to know, look how fast we're going through the lesson this week. We're already on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> love never fails. Now think that through. That's, that's, a, that's a quote from 1 Corinthians 13. Everybody knows it. Love never fails. What does it mean though? How does love never fail? When does love never fail? If love never fails, what happened to Lucifer and Judas? Did Jesus not love them? So what, what, what do we mean by love never fails. Did Jesus love Judas? Still did Jesus love Lucifer? Are they going to be saved? This is a universalist approach. Well, love never fails. That means eventually everyone's saved, even Lucifer, even Satan, because love never fails. Is that what it means? Love is eternal. So what does it mean it never fails? Jesus still loves Lucifer. Are there limits to what love can achieve? Yes. Oh, okay, that's a, maybe. A, so what are the limits? What limits love? Self. Say that again. Self. Okay. Individual, volitional choice. Why is that necessarily true? Why? Love is freedom. Because can you have love without individual volitional choice? If, you, if we had nanochips, you could inject into your kids to form a network in their brain, and you could then go to your computer and program them to come to you at 3 o'clock, Daddy, I love you, and they do. Is that love? <laughs> no, God has the power to program us. He could do it. He's, he's the power. He's infinite. But the moment he does it, are we able to love him anymore? And we're just robots. We're machines. We're mechanical at that point. Genuine love requires genuine freedom. So the limits of love are within the free will sentient being. So how do we understand then that love never fails? Love never fails to be loving. Love never fails to be loving. I would even go farther. How do we understand love? Is it, do we understand love right now as we're talking about this? Are we still only understanding it relationally, emotionally, compassionately, or do we take it to another level beyond that? Which includes all that, of course. Do we understand it structurally, functionally? <coughs> love is the protocol upon which life is constructed. The principle of giving, every breath you take, you give away carbon dioxide, the plants get back oxygen to you, the never-ending circle of giving upon which life is built, the whole universe is constructed on the law of love. God is love, everything's built this way. We understand love in this way, does it fail? Love never fails, it never fails. It's always giving, always restoring, always rejuvenating, always sustaining, always the source of life. It always is, what fails? When we break the design, when we cross the line, when we sever the connection. So the failure comes not in love, the failure comes in selfishness, in sinfulness. When we breach that line, then the wages of sin is death. Sin when full grown brings forth death. What fails is trying to live outside of the design. The design never fails. That's the way I understand it. Any, any, does that make sense or did I lose people? Middle section asks, what are some examples you can find in history or even today of how Christians or at least people bearing the name Christians have done some terrible deeds, sometimes even in the name of Jesus? Yes, Wendell. I objected to this question in Tuesday and to the bottom of uh, Monday's lesson, the same thing, or, or I mean Sunday's lesson. They had a similar the one I just read or a different one? The one you just read. Okay. And at the bottom of, of Sunday was very similar to, in, in the highlighted area, how might selfishness play, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I go back to Philippians 4.8. <clears throat> it 
In conclusion, my friends, fill your minds with those things that are good, that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. I don't think we should dwell on the mistakes of the past. We dwell and, and concentrate on what God is like, and then by beholding, we become changed. Okay, and that, what you just cited, was a design law. We don't need to dwell on all the examples of how I have failed or some my neighbor has failed. We need to, dis to fill our minds with examples of how God has been faithful to us. You know. Thoughts about that? Thoughts about the question? Thoughts about Wendell's comments? Yes. When we dwell on our failures, is that Satan reminding us just sometimes that's in our minds and it's hard to get out? And then I usually pray and I say, Lord, help me, you know, bring your love into my heart. I tend not to give a single answer for a question like that. I, 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 I tend not to globalize. In other words, when we dwell on our mistakes, could it be an evil intelligence trying to discourage us? Sure. Is it always an evil intelligence or could it be our own insecurity? Is our own unresolved um, guilt or unhappiness with what we've done that we're not at peace with yet that's originating in our own self? That could be another reason. So I, I think that's a possibility what you said and I think that can happen. Pardon? It could be a learning endeavor. It could be a learning endeavor. You're reflecting over it. I mean, how, how many people have maybe just got a, it's not a moral issue, you haven't done a sin, you just got something wrong. You, you failed an exam and you really feel bad because you got an F on an exam. Now, that's not morally right or wrong. It's just a, a, a performance. And you spend a lot of time thinking about all those questions and going over them in your mind. There can be that aspect that Russell's mentioning, learning of life's experiences. It could be a relationship in which you, somebody broke up with you and you spend a lot of time reflecting and reviewing on that. Does that mean that you've necessarily done something wrong? No, but maybe there are lessons. What can I learn from that? What, 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 how can I uh, make changes in me that can be more effective in future relationships? There's, there's, there's places for those reflections as well. But yes, sometimes people get stuck and they're being stuck and they're having things brought to their attention that they've resolved for the purpose of discouragement. That happens too. And I think the devil does do that to people. I just don't want to be global. Yes. <coughs> then what, why the Bible itself talks so much about negative events. I was it to ask you. Okay, so why do medical textbooks have so many pictures of disease? So you can learn from it, recognize it. And why do they have so many pictures of disease, so many descriptions of symptoms, so many pathological and disgusting looking things? Why, why is it there in the medical textbook? To recognize it and correct it. Uh, be, uh, because, it, but it, it, it's there to recognize, true, but it's never there in isolation in the medical text. There's always there with the treatments to how to resolve it and, and help it and heal it. So the Bible is that very thing for our, our, for our souls and for the world and for the universe. Here's what sin does. It corrupts, it corrodes, it destroys. And here's the solution that heals and restores. That's why. Thank you. So the question, did anybody want to comment on the question? Examples we find in history uh, 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 overruling the objection from Wendell. <laughs> but Wendell's got a good point. It's a balanced thing. I think we don't want to get stuck looking in the rear view mirror of life. I have patients that come to see me and all they do is they look constantly in the rear view mirror of their life. The shortcomings, disappointments, failures, bad mistakes they've made and they just ruminate constantly over the, try driving your car looking only in the rear view mirror. No, do not. <laughs> Oh yeah, that is not a direction. I was a, that was that was a uh, what's it called? A rhetorical statement, not a not a directive. Okay. Thank you, Russell. I don't want to get sued here for somebody following my directions. See? But the point is, if you tried to drive your car driving looking only in the rearview mirror, it, <laughs> you're almost certain to wreck. Right. And this is what happened to people's lives. They wreck their lives because they never have a vision for the future. They're only reliving the past. Yes. Isn't that also Satan's uh, doing so to try to convince us that God does not forgive us and that they're always there and sure. keep bringing it up and bringing it up? It's like not trusting God. So I tell my patients, uh, using the car driving metaphor, that we, it's our life, we, we stay focused on the future and where we're going, on fulfilling our purposes and missions in life, but we occasionally glance in the rearview mirror to learn lessons so we aren't repeating the mistakes of the past. But that's about the, the time involved. We don't spend a lot of time looking in the rearview mirror. But if we forget, there's a statement from Ellen White that says, um, we have nothing to fear for the future, save we forget 
the, the way the Lord has delivered in the past. Okay, and, this, and, and if you think about that, it's not, she wasn't focusing on the, the shortcomings and the failures in the past. She was focusing when we've had shortcomings and failures, the Lord has delivered us from them. But you can't remember the delivery. Um, Mary Magdala couldn't remember how she was saved unless she also remembered the hole she was in. So they all kind of connect together, don't they? But it was the focus on the deliverance and the restoration, not the, 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 the mistake itself. The reality of life front windscreen is totally opaque. You only have vision for there's an interesting point. We don't know the future. So we don't know what the future is going to bring. But, but as we're moving, in, moving forward in the future, we can actually know the direction we're heading. Yes, but since you can't see through your windscreen, you have no clue whether that's the right direction or not. Yeah, but what you do if you're following the instruments. The pilot in fog has got his instruments. He can't see through the windshield, but he's following the instruments. And our instruments are in God's word, understanding his design, his protocols, the principles that we live by. So we stay on course with how we live our life on principles of other-centeredness and love, but we may not see where the future is taking us. If you're driving home by IFR today, remind me, because I'm going to wait until you get there. Okay. We, we can, with the knowledge of design law, we can more accurately predict the future. That's true. And Tim, and Tim has used the you know, drop in the pin example. Uh, a six-year-old can tell you what's going to happen without the gift of prophecy. So understanding the way life is designed to operate gives us a certain amount of predictability and a certain amount of stability. How many doctors have been able to predict for a patient what will happen if the patient doesn't take their medicine? If the patient does, if the patient continues to you this particular, continue smoking your cigarettes, continue whatever, you can predict what, what the course is going to be without the gift of prophecy, because the design laws are being uh, breached and you, can, and you have the accuracy to know that. Let me jump ahead. A couple other things I wanted to get into really quick, if I can. Oh, that was, uh, um, it also asks us to talk about in 1 Corinthians, um, looking at 1 Corinthians 13, asking us uh, some examples of what love doesn't do and what does love not do. In 1 Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. Get your mind around that. That's what it said. I admit, I've gotten a really lot of heat from certain segments of the theological world when I point out that love keeps no record of wrongs and God is love. And if God is love, and that's, that's an equal. Remember how the equal sign works? Okay. Okay. Then, then, then that God keeps no record of wrongs. Whoa, wait a second, hold on. How do we understand this? Because there are passages that clearly say that the names kept in the record book, the Lamb's Book of Life, and, and they will be judged after the books were open, they'll be judged after the things kept in the books. Uh, wait a second, what's going on? Which law lens are you looking through? If you're looking through imperial human law constructs, then record books are judicial in nature, and they're accounting books to find fault and to bring accountability to those who are recorded in the book. If that's, your, if that's your law lens. If your design law lens, though, when patients go to the doctors or the hospital, are their records being kept? And what are the primary purpose of the records? To find fault to inflict judicial punishments on patients or to diagnose and accurately keep accounting of that and the treatment that's being applied and then the hopefully healing and restoration that's coming from the treatment. But if the doctor diagnoses accurately, and it's recorded in the record, accurate diagnosis, provides a treatment that has a 100%, 100% cure rate, but the patient either rejects the diagnosis, I refuse to believe that's my problem, or re refuses the treatment and therefore dies and the family sues the doctor, what comes into evidence? The records come into evidence to judge and punish the patient or to show the doctor was right in his diagnosis, the doctor was right in his treatment, and the only reason the patient died is because they refused the truth. Now we can have perfect harmony from the scripture. Love is not keeping record of wrongs. Love is accurately diagnosing and providing the remedy to heal and restore. And yes, the wicked in the end who die will be diagnosed by what's recorded in the records. The diagnosis is accurate, and thus God's judgment in the end let him who is righteous be righteous still. Let him who is wicked be wicked still. It's an accurate diagnosis of the condition of each person's heart. Those who've partaken of Christ and been transformed and those who have not. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are such a 
good God, a God that's sensible, reasonable, a God who has created and constructed all reality to operate in harmony with your beautiful nature of love. We thank you for the privilege of understanding what you have uh, provided through Jesus Christ, and we ask that your spirit be poured out. Take what Christ has achieved, renew it in us, and empower us to, to connect the dots in our own mind, that we can have better discernment, better understanding of how reality works in your kingdom, and share this more effectively with others around us. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Yeah, thank you.